So uh, we are in John chapter 13. It's a really special part of uh, John's gospel, actually, because it comes after a transition. So in the very beginning of this uh, crossword Bible study, sounds like it was just yesterday, yesterday uh, we uh, talked about how uh, the gospel, according to John, can be divided into two parts. The very first part is called the Book of Signs. And those, can anybody tell me what the Book of Signs is? His miracles or his signs, those are the, the um, where in that section of the book, there are seven signs that are recorded that Jesus does that reveal his uh, identity, that reveals himself to his believers and to the people around him. So that is the book of signs. And now we're transitioning into the second part of John's work, uh, not it, which is the book of glory. Now, what's so glorious about it? Last week, Jesus seemed to be riding pretty high. Well, it was a donkey, but still, he was riding. And, uh, yeah, that joke just came to me right there. <laughs> pretty good. Farm joke. <laughs> yes. Well, we did talk about sheep a couple weeks ago. A lot of farm jokes there. Um, so, last week, Jesus literally rode into Jerusalem, and the people were hailing him as the Messiah. And they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us, Lord, save us. They thought he had come to save them. And he's coming out of this amazing miracle where he brought his friend back to life. Truly, truly amazing. And the crowds are just flocking to him at every festival. They want to hear him talk. They want to hear him all this great wisdom and these, uh, these signs that he's performing. They want to witness all this goodness. That just seems pretty glorious to me. <coughs> but now we're entering into the part of the book where Jesus' public ministry has gone kaput. Uh, he is basically hiding in an upper room with only his closest friends. There's no more public ministry. There's no more, you know, going out and about and, uh, you know, taking jabs at the Pharisees. Jesus has already done all that. He's laid the groundwork phenomenally well when it comes to really making the, the religious leaders mad. So now, it's a Thursday evening, just before the Passover, and Jesus is celebrating a, or just having a meal with his closest, closest friends. And another very important aspect of this book of glory, is that whereas in the book of signs, it was a very common theme that Jesus said, my hour has not yet come. And his very first sign, at his mother's request to help out, he says, woman, my, eye, my hour has not yet come, meaning my hour of glorification, the hour where I am lifted up and used as a sacrifice for the whole world. It's not time yet. But you'll know when it's time, because I decide when it's time. I have power over my life. And he said this uh, with Mary. He said this in the last uh, chapter, I believe, when the Greeks came to talk to him. And uh, finally, it's here. The hour of his glorification is at this point. And it's not just an hour. Uh, what is meant by this hour is it's more of a time. It's a period. It's not an exact moment like when Jesus feet, uh, washes his feet. Uh, his disciples' feet, or even when he's before Pilate, or just when he's on the cross, Jesus' hour, his hour of glorification, spans from this moment all the way to Easter morning. This is his hour. This is his decision. This is the chain of events that he starts. No one starts it for him. Only Jesus. It's his glory, not Denzel Washington's glory. Or anybody else. I've never actually seen that movie, but I thought it was fun. Yeah, is it good? Okay. Any questions there? So Jesus, it, it's come down to the end. Uh, they're in the upper room, and he, he's loved his own. He's been with them, and he knows his time is coming soon. And so he washes his disciples' feet. Now, 
The idea of washing your guest's feet or your friend's feet isn't too uh, uncommon, particularly in Jesus' day. Uh, for example, people walk around in sandals. And Jesus and his crew in particular did a lot of walking. And so it was necessary, especially with you know, stinky guys, to wash your feet before you walk inside. Because you're going to take your sandals off before you go inside. And you can't have feet looking like this. Um, there. But so there was a practical side to uh, foot washing. But also, there is a much more ritualistic, much more uh, religious significance to the idea of washing. The Jews had a special bath and a special ceremony called the mikvah. Uh, and it was a ritual cleansing of their bodies because uh, what's set down in the Old Testament law are means of uh, maintaining ritual purity. Um, so that you could, you know, go into the temple or eat certain meals and stuff like that, you had to be ritually clean and pure. And if certain actions, uh, you know, you did, not even necessarily sins, but just encounters, caused you to be ritually impure, normally a, uh, a uh, solution to becoming pure is to bathe. Because when you bathe, not only are you washing physical impurities off of your body, but... In Judaism, there's a connection between what is physical and what is spiritual. You can't necessarily separate the two. So washing in water also uh, denoted a washing of the soul, a washing of the spirit. Uh, generally, it was a servant or a slave's task to do the washing, not the master. And also, I thought this was pretty neat, a bridegroom is usually cleansed in a mikvah on the day of his wedding. Now, in John's Gospel, we have a tremendous amount of wedding imagery of Christ as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. And that wedding that happens on the cross of Christ to his church. Well, this is the night before he is married to the church, his bride. And so, it's only fitting that he wash. So, there's that. But also, as I said, there's a really intense bond between the body and soul in Judaism. And this carries over into Christianity. Uh, the outward washing is supposed to uh, affect a spiritual change. For example, when you are impure and you wash, you shouldn't be doing it just as a means of, uh, of ceremony, a ritual. It should imply a cleansing of the heart. And uh, Jesus runs into conflicts over this with the Pharisees and I believe with John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, when they say, hey, your disciples, they aren't, they aren't washing before they eat. What's the deal? And Jesus replies, you think you are acting like this is a problem, but really, you're just concerned with the ceremony. Your hearts aren't cleansed, or your hearts aren't circumcised. And I forget which gospel that's in, or if it's even in, in this gospel, but it's in there, I promise and so, uh, the outward washing, it's supposed to affect a spiritual change, a spiritual cleansing. So consider Peter's response to Jesus, you know. Jesus gets to Peter, and Jesus wants to wash his hands, and he says, Lord, do you wash my feet? And, of course, Jesus said, I mentioned Jesus said this a lot to Peter. What I'm doing, you're not going to understand now, but you'll understand later. Uh, and he says, if you, if you don't let me wash you, you have no part in me. And so, Peter says, oh, well, then not just my feet, my, my hands as well, my, my feet, wash all of me, so that I can be fully a part of you. So, Jesus cleanses their bodies in an act of service, and then charges them to be men who spiritually serve others. This isn't just a uh, kind of a nice thing to do. Jesus is really leading by example. Any questions? Does anybody want me to wash their feet? In about a month and a half, yeah. yeah. Uh, and this isn't just the apostles. Um, this is a lesson for us as his disciples, as the uh, receivers of that tradition. We are called to wash each other's feet and to be washed by Jesus Christ. To be washed so that we can have part in him. In a way. This is 
starting to sound pretty sacramental. And that's because it is very sacramental. The whole idea that there's a connection between the physical and the spiritual realm that can't be divided uh, is sacramental. A sacrament, as we learn in, in uh, Christian formation and in our confirmation classes and in Sunday school, a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. A major sacramental theme in John is that Jesus has come to redeem both the body and the soul. So it supports the notion that not only is Jesus washing the feet just so that, you know, Peter doesn't track mud all over the upper room, but it's also that so that Peter can be, in a sense, baptized in Jesus, cleansed of his sin in Jesus, and made um, and be made prepared to serve him by washing others. This plays out in the sacraments of the church that we encounter on a daily basis. What happens when we receive the Eucharist? When we take part in Jesus, when we are fed this little wafer-looking thing in this wine, we, not only are we being physically fed in a sense, in a sense, but we're also being spiritually fed, made part, made a part of Jesus, drawing closer to Him, being forgiven by Him, receiving His grace. Jesus ministers to us just like He ministered to His apostles. And in that way, we receive grace. But then we're asked to be ministers of others. We don't just go into the church and go home and do nothing for a week. And then go back to church and then go do nothing for a week. At least we shouldn't. That is not what it's all about. Especially in the post-communion prayer. And we say this every Sunday at 8.30. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. So in receiving the sacrament, we take part in Jesus' body and blood. We are assured that we have received him and comforted because now we are made heirs with him. We literally take part in the divine life in doing so, but we're then called to go out and do, some, and do something about it. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. This is what the Mass is for. This is what... Uh, you know, baptism and confirmation, all the sacraments are for, we don't uh, take our life and put it under a bushel. We don't, you know, I was going to think of more, uh, more imagery, but we don't need that. <laughs> so, just as I've been saying, what I've done for you, you should do also. Jesus doesn't intend for this to be an isolated event. Right now, what he's doing is he's preparing. He's preparing and he's teaching his apostles what it means to live a life according to Christ, even without him. In washing his disciples' feet, Jesus sets the new standard of behavior for how his disciples should live. And that's because, uh, particularly in the synoptic gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, we, we really frequently run into occasions where the apostles are having a little squabble. And it's always about who's the greatest. They were really, really intrigued on who out of, all, out of the twelve was the greatest of them all. And Peter here is showing them that they're completely missing the point. If not, uh, sorry, they're completely missing the point because to live according to Christ means to humiliate oneself, to have humbleness, humility, and to serve your fellow Christian, regardless of if it, uh, you know, brings you more power over the other. You don't want that. Rather, Jesus, the master, goes to the bottom of the table and serves his people. 
Jesus' glory is seen in his self-giving. See, we're in the book of glory. Everything Jesus does is glorifying, and especially through his actions and with, uh, you know, with his encounter with his disciples. And in Luke 22, which is the, uh, the um, Last Supper in the Gospel according to Luke, they actually have an argument right there at the supper saying, hey, who's going to be the greater one? And Jesus says, for who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? He's not the one who reclines at table, but I am among you as the one who serves. So, Jesus' glory is seen in this self-giving, but he also resets the standard for how his apostles should think of themselves, particularly after he is gone. Is everybody following at this point? We good? Glorious, yes, fair. <laughs> so, Jesus, uh, having washed his disciples' feet and had uh, this conversation with Peter, um, they sit down to have the Last Supper. And in it, we see that Jesus is troubled. When was the last time Jesus was troubled? With Lazarus, yes. He saw his friend uh, Lazarus dead. And he was troubled. He showed this really intense human emotion of a person who's not necessarily at peace. He had the same encounter after Lazarus, uh, just after he encountered the Greeks that went up to Philip. We're like, hey, we would see Jesus. Um, he's troubled. And I believe he's troubled because he knows, oh, he knows that this is the last time he's going to speak to his friends. Until he is resurrected. This is the last time that things will really be the same. And so he's troubled. Because he loves his friends. He loves them so much that he's given them himself. But nevertheless, he came here for a purpose. And so he said, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And after some whispering between John and Peter... Jesus says, the one who, you know, takes the morsel from me, he, he'll do it. And it's Judas. And so at that moment, Jesus says, go, do what you are going to do. Notice that Jesus doesn't wait to be, uh, you know, bamboozled by Judas. He doesn't wait for, you know, Judas to kind of sneakily go off. He knows what's in Judas' heart. He knows... Uh, what he's planning to do. He's known from the very beginning. And so, he says, go, do it. And this is Jesus saying, my hour has come. He tells Judas to do it. And then, we have this uh, nice little flare, and it was night. What do y'all think that means? Darkness. And what? So, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. What is associated with darkness in John's gospel? Sin. Uh, namely, a separation from God. Because God is light, the source of light and life. And so, even now, in the midst of night, in darkness, the Son of Man is glorified. And so, Jesus, you know, having gotten the train out of the way, he said, you know where I'm going? You can't follow me. And speaking these last few words to his disciples, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. That you love one another. So, our two big lessons from Jesus is to serve one another and to love one another. Jesus is giving his final instructions to his church, how they are to live around one another, how they're supposed to live in accordance with the rest of the world. And they're characterized, they are characterized by their love. He says, you will, people will know that you're my disciples because of how you love each other. And so that's our big call, is to share in Christ's love and to spread Christ's love. 
Just like with serving, with washing the feet, it's not an isolated event, but it's something that needs to be passed on and spread throughout the world. Where can we love others more? More according to Christ. For the love of Pete, my dad used to say that a lot. Uh, so, at this point, Pete says, Lord, uh, wherever you're going, I'm going to follow you. I love you that much. And Jesus says, before the night's up, you're going to deny me three times. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. Talk about embarrassing for Peter. But Peter, in here, in this case, is an example for all of us, and he represents all of us. There are two denials that sort of happened at, on this night, a Monday, Thursday. And you have Jesus's, or Judas's uh, betrayal of Jesus, which is a denial of who Jesus is. And then you have Peter's denial of Jesus, which uh, is a little bit down the road, but we'll still talk about it. Because they should be seen sort of in contrast to each other. Where Judas uh, denied Jesus, he died unrepentant. He died in isolation, separated from the love of God through his denial. <clears throat> Peter denied Jesus. And Peter, in his shame, came back and asked for forgiveness. And he experienced Christ's love, made possible through his, his death and resurrection. Peter is our example because all of us are going to sin. All of us are going to make a decision that uh, betrays Christ and what he did for us. All of us have done it. Our job is to be like Peter and to come back. Don't be like Judas and wallow in our isolation, wallow in our despair. But no, be like Peter and seek your Savior. Seek his mercy. I already said that. So, uh, lastly, uh, so what took place on this night and what happens in the next chapter and really until the Garden of Gethsemane, is what we now know as Maundy Thursday, or Holy Thursday. And uh, this is something the church celebrates every single year um, during Holy Week, the week leading up to Easter, the week that starts on Sunday and uh, ends with Easter, or the Easter Vigil, on Saturday night. And uh, Maundy Thursday itself is um, part of the, what is known as the Triduum, which means three days. And Monday Thursday is part of a three-service sort of deal, a three-service liturgy. Uh, that includes Monday Thursday, where we remember this Last Supper, uh, the institution of the Eucharist, the washing of the disciples' feet, and finally, uh, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what follows that is Good Friday, where we remember his crucifixion. This is the most solemn day of the year. And then finally, this uh, triduum ends with the Easter Vigil, the lighting of the Paschal fire and the Alleluia after uh, 40 days of not saying the Alleluia. The triduum, in particular, and really Holy Week, this is the week that we prepare for during Lent. We prepare with fasting so that we can be more aware, more spiritually ready for the saving grace and the, the beautifulness of Christ's salvation that happens at Easter. That's why we, we do Lent. So we sort of remember and celebrate and reenact these final moments of Jesus, where he did these things, instituted the Eucharist, washed his disciples' feet. We, on the Monday, Thursday service, we have a Eucharist. And at the end of it, we have a little bit reserved. And we process with that reserved sacrament to the Lady Chapel, which is usually covered in dark and beautiful flowers. And this is to represent Jesus' path, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this in coming weeks, path from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he stays the night. And it's during that night that we have sign-ups for who's going to watch with Jesus, to watch with him for an hour in this chapel. So we celebrate that, and you'll also see uh, some priests during the offertory leaning down on that terrible, hard tile and, and washing feet. Um, that's one of the most special uh, events you could take part in. Um, it's a point where the priests uh, fulfill 
their priestly vocation in washing all of your feet. Um, so I would invite all of you to do that. big takeaways this evening is what Jesus taught his own disciples during that last supper. Serve one another, love one another. Just as Christ has served you, just as Christ has loved you, spread that. Spread it to others in whatever way you can. And that's all I got. Are there any questions?